and I will play clicker for you. Just let me know. All right, for sure. Hello, everyone. Um, so, welcome to our Cybersecurity Foundation Common Network. Keep in mind that it does have some information security mixed into that. The, the big uh, difference, because a lot of people get told, right, is uh, information security looks at information as a whole. So that's where your physical controls come in, your processes, things like that. Cybersecurity, its main focus is on the attackers, the attacks, how to mitigate them, things like that. But no good cybersecurity foundation can't work. It can really be good uh, if you didn't include some of those information security aspects. It's going to be uh, there. It's going to have generalizations in it because it's meant for as an intro to cybersecurity, not an advanced topic. Because each one of these topics could go along for their own lectures. Okay, I'm ready. So why is cybersecurity important? Uh, nowadays, everybody is connected more to the internet than ever. They're texting, cell phone, um, VOIP, their washers and dryers are on the internet, ovens, everything's there. Um, most of your communications are going to take place there. Well, since all of this allows us to be remote, it allows the, crimin uh, the criminals to attack remotely also. They no longer have to sit there and seek out a target. They just throw a general uh, wave out there and see what they catch. Um, and to top that all off, uh, to make it even worse, cybercrime now and malware has as a service. It's like infrastructure as a service. You now have cybercrime as a service. So the advanced people don't really have to do all the hard work anymore and put out the risk. They build program sell it to people, and then those people use it on mute. That's why a lot of times when you get uh, a phishing email, you'll notice that you get it four or five different times from different people. It's actually a campaign. So with cybersecurity, one of the problems that we all face is a few negative stigmas. Uh, one, as you saw earlier, it slows down performance, trying to get in, trying to get logged in, and things like that. It also puts uh, weight on resources, uh, on, uh, CPU processing times, things like that, which really matters in a high computer world. Uh, one of the things that people believe is when they're sitting through all these trainings that they're being trained to do cybersecurity's job, which is not really the case. The cybersecurity people are there to put the tools in and try to protect from the threats going on. They also add education so that every user would be able to catch these because if they were to lock it down to where you're going to be safe, you wouldn't even be able to use the computer. So they had to find the happy medium. And that's where the training and constant changing tools are. You know, everybody, uh, I heard this a lot, that security people are hard to deal with, hard to work with, because they only see things as black and white. You're secure, you're not. This is how you got to do it. And in our world, in education, you can't live that type of life. Uh, security has to be very flexible for us to perform what we're going to do. And last but not least, a lot of people believe that security is just blown out of proportion and people don't have as many issues as cybersecurity people say they do. So how do we change that culture? Uh, one thing should be that I firmly believe we should be making it look like a benefit. Because what you learn at work is the exact same thing that you can take home with. All of these uh, things, that's what's keeping your family from getting scammed because it's the same principle. So if we look at it as a benefit more than a burden, then, and then, then we'll be able to uh, sit through those long lectures and feel more beneficial with that six month security training we have to take. Um, Everyone should always practice these practice at home or work, doesn't matter where you're at, because you want to turn it into a culture, not something that you do, because you want it to be automatic. That's the only way it's going to protect you. Cybersecurity professionals should be using effective communication and should be interactive and more collaborative. That's always been a thing. Um, I'll probably throw a term or two, but don't worry, those will be defined later on. But it's like anybody's job. Uh, if I call accounting, I don't want to know all the accounting terms. I just want to know that I'm getting paid, right? Well, the same thing is with cybersecurity, but 
we have to study so many terms, we're pretty proud of them, so we have to throw these guys out every now and then. So other things, uh, cybersecurity teams should always be available for questions and assistance. Uh, generally, what happens is if you only hear from us when you've got a problem and there's something wrong with your computer and you've got to do this, well, we really should have that more as a two-way. So say you've just got a general security question. There's no reason why you shouldn't be able to pick up the phone and call your cybersecurity or shoot them an email and say, hey, you know, I saw such and such and such and such out there. Should I be worried? What do you think? Things like that. Now, they're going to be a little limited in some of the answers. They're always going to defer to the safe answer, but there's no reason why it shouldn't be there. College computing, I'm always asking, hey, if you need something more than this, come to me anytime because that's what I'm there for. Um, Another problem is that you always train why something's the problem. How many of you guys have uh, ever asked a question and basically they just say, it's policy, and that's why? Just because I said so. Well, I had a case not long ago when I tried it out, and I explained to them, this is why it's a, a policy problem, because this is what would happen to you if you do it. And if you do that, that provides a much more positive interaction engagement rather than the policy because I said so and hang up the phone or because we're going to fail an audit because there's a reason why you're going to fail an audit. There's a reason why it's against compliancy. So if I tell you what the problem is, that's something that you can take home with you and say, well, they don't do this. So I probably shouldn't do this either. Somebody calls me up and says, hey, what's your social security number? I should say, nah, I'll call you back if I think that's who you are. Um, and one thing that uh, a place that was at that did HIPAA, we actually would send emails every day of uh, HIPAA violations, and you would you're talking millions of dollars of uh, fines and HIPAA breaches. So we would show that just so everybody said, "Hey, this is pretty common. We're getting an email every day, and it's these big companies, not the small ones that we're seeing these on." So oh, just in time feedback, I was told they didn't want to see me. That if you stand by the screen in advance. They couldn't. They they couldn't see you talking. Oh, okay. Somebody stand up there. That's fine. Nobody wants that. <laughs> so I think I just get two slides. Let me make sure. See what happens if you give me the clicker. So the biggest and meanest threat out there is social engineering. A lot of times people will call it hacking humans because you're basically trying to figure out what people are thinking, how to get them what you want to do, and things like that. Uh, they're going to use um, and guide the social interactions so they can get that preferred outcome. Uh, and they, sometimes they actually do their research before they call you up. I mean, I'm sitting out here in the, in the lunch area and I hear people's dogs' names, people's family names, all the things that I need if I wanted to start trying to crack a password. I mean, that's all social engineer does. Um, they're generally going to work on your emotions. Uh, Thoughts such as they're going to try to scare you into doing something. They're going to try to get you to feel sorry for them. Hey, my boss is going to be mad if I can't get in the server room, even though I'm not on this. Uh, can you can you do me this solid? Things like that. They're always going to work on some kind of emotion because that's just the best target. And I actually almost fell, fell for one because they got me mad and said that I bought something. Here's your invoice. And I was like, ah! and I'm like, oh, wait a minute. If I didn't buy it, then I'll just go contest it at the bank. I'm not going to reply to this email. But I was almost ready to press that button. Uh, so it's important when you talk about social engineering to think about how we all social engineer every day. I mean, uh, when you look at the definition, it kind of leaves this out. But you're really doing it. I mean, you meet and make friends a lot of times in departments and outside of departments to get that inside track. Hey, I'm going to get this buddy, call my buddy at IT over here because he's going to put me ahead of everybody and get my computer fixed so I can get this done. Um, we may guide the conversation to learn uh, to, to learn a person, including their boss, so we can prepare for that positive interaction. I may go ask questions about, well, who is this person and do they like this? Do they like that? That way, when I'm talking to them, um, I get, you know, they're not going to be mad because I said something out of place. We're going to converse and try to figure people out. And uh, we will actually steer 
conversations. Uh, and keep in mind when you're doing social engineering, it's not always one one conversation. Like I'll come up and I'll pretend to be your friend, or maybe maybe I'll put a profile out on a dating site and meet somebody, and I pretend like I'm interested. And so we're sitting here with these conversations, and every time I'm talking to you, I'm kind of talking about something else, but I always inject what I want in there so that I can get the answer that I want. Or I'll always slowly lead a conversation, and the reason they'll do it with more than one conversation is, is because if I start asking too many of the same questions at once, it triggers people's minds. Hey, wait a minute. Those are all my security questions. But if I ask them once in a while, and I, I take two weeks, three weeks to do it, I slowly sit here and gather your information. So social engineering can be scary because uh, you, we put out all kinds of things. Uh, like I can follow your social media profile and just pull all kinds of information about you. And I say me, but you know anybody can do that. But keep in mind, when we're doing this, it's just basically all you're doing is uh, trying to manipulate the events to get the information or get the outcome that you want. So now that we know how we do it, let's talk about how attackers do it. So attackers will, uh, they have two ways they do it. They have physical and virtual. Uh, virtual is pretty easy. Uh, you'll hear phishing, which is one of those terms I'll explain later. It's basically emails. Calls and texts, they fall under the same category, but they have different names. And that's where I was talking, we love our terms. You'll hear phishing, vishing, smishing, and it just keeps on going. But the main thing to remember is, as people are using virtual means trying to steal your information. Physical is the easy one. We're all guilty of quite a few of these. Uh, tailgating being one. An example of tailgating is you and your coworker come in after lunch. You, you swipe in the card, coworker follows you in. That's actually tailgating. You really don't know. Maybe the coworker was fired during lunch, like uh, Dave was. Yeah. You know, so so uh, keep that in mind that you're you're running an assumption when you let somebody in. Now, if you don't know who they are, you, you definitely want to let that door shut and let them use their credentials. Don't just assume that they belong there. Shoulder surfing is always a good one. Um, people standing behind you, looking over your shoulder, still in the information might be writing it down. Um, so anything that you could be writing, you know, they make these screens now where unless you're directly looking at them, you can't see it. A lot of people use them on airplanes. Uh, one people don't really consider that much is dumpster diving. Uh, I've seen this in action. Uh, people dive in your dumpster and they just start shredding through all the information and pulling files. We had somebody at one company trying to steal. They went to work for a different company, started their own, and they were trying to steal our client list by dumpster diving. Uh, compromising USB sticks. Uh, basically, uh, everybody uses thumb, jump, uh, thumb drives, jump drives, whatever you want to call them, USB sticks. They will uh, throw one down, maybe out here in the GA parking lot, something like that. Somebody's going to pick it up and go, gee, I wonder what's on this, and they pop it in their computer. As soon as they done, it's over. They have control of your computer. They've done anything they wanted to do at that point. And uh, another good way they do is they'll convince someone to allow them access. Like at the front front door, they'll come in, to the receptionist, carry on a conversation. Well, I'm supposed to be here doing different types of variables they'll end up getting in there. I actually heard a story years ago of a lady that did not use a computer at all. Uh, her own laptop, she would walk in the door and she would somehow end up in the server room, pull a thumb drive out, stick it in their server, pull the information, go in and hand it to the boss and say, here's your information right here. So, yeah, I mean, it's convincing people to get in is a lot easier than you think. Uh, so different ways that we can defend against social engineering, now that I've got everybody nervous and scared. <laughs> is uh, the big thing I'll start with virtual because cybersecurity is do not open links. It doesn't matter if you know that person, um, if it's a friend, if it looks legit, there's many different ways to spoof it. And your friend may have already fell for that attack and it just copied there and sent it out of their email address. So 
Try not to open the links and always verify any files that you get. Did you intend on sending these files? Because I've had people say, uh, no, I haven't. And then that's how they find out that they fell for it. Uh, make a call or verify uh, to who they are. And uh, because you always want to assume it's an attack. Because nowadays, it's best to assume it's an attack. So you should always have that call or verify. Looking at the caller ID, it's not going to work because people can spoof the numbers. Uh, they'll call you and say, hey, I'm trying to reach such and such and such and such. Can you give me some information? And it's like, well, you called me. Why don't you give me some? And even if you have a doubt, you can always say, I tell you what, I don't know. I'm going to call you back. What extension can I reach at? I'm calling from the main number. If they don't do that, then it could be that you got a problem. Uh, from the physical, you always want to stay informed on social engineering tactics. I mean, that could fall for virtual as well. And be aware of your surroundings because you've always got somebody that could be looking over your shoulder anytime you're doing something. You're at the coffee shop, you're at the airport, you're trying to get some work done. There's always somebody kind of lingering around. Make sure nobody's looking over your shoulder. Always properly dispose of any information, whether it's shredding it, uh, you can go in and uh, you can scrub a hard drive. But keep in mind when you're dealing with hard drives, uh, it's never a guarantee that that information's gone. There's roles in computer forensics that will sit there and put a computer disk back together that somebody broke and pull information off of it that was supposedly deleted. So when you're dealing with like a server that's got sensitive information on it, always get rid of that hard drive. Uh, shred it, uh, crush it, or if it's at work, you can turn it into your IT department who does all of that for you. Never trust any devices that uh, aren't yours that you can 100% guarantee that they are safe. Uh, and, and that goes the same as networks. I mean, even, I never put my phone on anybody's network except for mine or my family's because I'm doing work on it. Even here at school, I don't put my phone on the network, not because I think that the network's dangerous, it's just a habit I like to maintain. I pay for unlimited data, so I'm gonna use it. Um, so some important, very important notes about social engineering, and I can give you some stories about these, is do not cause a physical confrontation. If somebody pushes their way past that door, don't try to shut them back in, don't try to do anything like that. You wanna go ahead and just get the get a description, call police and security, because you don't know why that person's coming in, you don't know that person's temperament, you don't know the personality, you don't wanna let the trained professionals get involved in that. And when I say security, I mean uh, physical security, not me, because I'm not gonna do <laughs> much good either. Uh, do not, don't challenge virtual or remote attackers. I mean, even if you know it's a scam and you don't sit there and play with them. Uh, there's a big uh, CISO that lost his job years ago. Basically, he went in and made a comment about anonymous and they, they took it as an invite and they went in and opened his life up to the world. Found every bad thing he had ever done and put it out, he lost his job. And basically, became invalid in the security service. Uh, you don't know where these guys live. It could be somebody living close enough to you. And once again, you don't know what their intent is. The best thing is just be polite. Don't give them any information and just let the call go. Um, never let emotional emotion affect your decisions. I mentioned that earlier. I was mad and I almost pressed that button. Always stop and think before you, uh, before you do anything because that's their target. They're wanting you to react badly. Um, and I always use cybersecurity or security, whichever group you have. If you do suspect social engineering is occurring, better safe than sorry. So I'm going to move on to malware. Um, malware is put together as malicious software. All right, so. Other things to uh, think about is when you're working at home or your home network is you have other people that come over to get on your network. You have uh, everybody's got Internet of Things devices now, uh, such as your thermostats and things like that. 
all of these can put your data at risk on your computer because uh, you don't know what the strange PC has on it. And Internet of Things objects have very basic systems on, so they don't have a lot of security in mind, which means somebody can get into your Internet of Things device and then jump off of that, and which we call pivoting and get into your computer, basically. So we're not saying it'll happen all the time, but it is a possibility. And then you have uh, what's called war driving, which is basically just people driving down the road looking for an internet connection to jump on. Can they get into it? What's on it? And then they'll do malicious things from your network so you get the money for it instead of them. So there's a, now I don't want to change screens. Did it change? Nope. Uh, there we go. So uh, there's there's different ways to protect yourself, as we mentioned the VPNs uh, before. But most of your devices come with firewalls, even a cell phone. You can download these firewalls, put them on. Always ensure your device firewalls are enabled. I know there are some support people out when they have an application problem, they'll tell you to disable your firewall and it starts working and they go, good, leave it that way. Make them fix it because uh, that firewall is blocking any inbound ports that you didn't open. Um, endpoint tools are also good, whether you're using antivirus, internet security suite. Uh, Georgia Tech, they came, they've got quite a few good endpoint tools, uh, XDR. Uh, for Cortex that we're all running, it works really, really well. I mean, I get hit by that quite a bit uh, from things that go on on the computer. Even though they were expected, we're in a computer-generated uh, school, so they're doing things that most people wouldn't do. Triggers that XDR quite a bit. Uh, Qualys, it checks vulnerabilities, which is also in your device. So that's when you'll hear us reaching out saying, hey, you need to update your PC. And a lot of your endpoint, the endpoint management tools that are on your computer do the auto updates for you. Um, and which comes into making sure your systems and software are always up to date. Uh, when you see the patches come out, or Chrome has been real bad about it lately, a little update button pops up in the corner. All of these are results of vulnerabilities that are found or a bug that's causing the software to crash. So it's very important to put those in. Now, when you, I can understand not wanting to jump up to a brand new operating system because that presents its own challenges. And uh, of course, as, it, as you get new systems, new bugs come into play, but you should always make sure all your security fixes are in place. Uh, when your home networks, there's a such thing called network isolation. They call them guest networks. And if you turn that on and connect things to the guest network, it actually isolates these devices where they can't even talk to each other. They can only talk to the internet. So if you put everything else on the guest and you keep your PCs and your printers and stuff that you need to do your job on your home network, that'll protect you from the holes of the other, of the other things. So not as scary as it sounded when I first come in the slide, uh, but those are where some homes will allow VLANs, which would do even better, but most of us aren't going to run VLANs in our own home because just the wireless for that's kind of expensive. Um, websites, that was another way that I was talking about earlier. They do pose their own risk. You'll hear uh, such thing as cross-site scripting and site forgery. So what these guys are is where you're able to input pretty much anything into a message room for some, uh, some type of comment field. You can go in and you can type a code in there and it will actually be script because that's how your computer works. It works off of the website telling your computer what to do, what the computer is asking. Well, with cross-site scripting, I can put a command in there that says, go to my or download this software, this virus, this thing. And so it, it can allow you to get those kinds of controls. Cross-site forgery is a little different. What cross-site forgery does in a nutshell is it makes your computer generate a command. So what they're betting on is I've got my bank account open right here. I'm on the bad website right here. It says transact $500 to this bank account over here. 
So that's how those two guys work. Um, the cross-site forgery is less out there as the cross-site scripting. They can be re they can be remediated pretty easy. Uh, then you have what's called typo squatting that causes uh, websites to be dangerous. Uh, basically, they're guessing that you're going to make a typo when you type your, type in the web address. And so these people will go out and buy every variation of gotech.edu that they can find. They wouldn't be able to use edu, obviously, but you get the point. They're going to they're going to look for gb.tech or uh, talk or something that something they think you're going to typo and they buy all these sites. So you'll go to these sites by accident and they're able to download their malicious software GPC. So anytime you hear the word typo squatting, that's what they're referring to. And then you, then there's DNS poisoning, which uh, DNS poisoning has traditionally been thought of as somebody gets into your DNS server, makes a bunch of entry changes. And everybody gets everybody's uh, computer gets that DNS cache when they reach out and they go somewhere, and uh, so they go to a bad site. That's generally a lot harder to do nowadays. But what they'll do is through social engineering and adware and things like that, they can actually poison the cache on your PC or create a host file so you always go to the wrong sites. Which XDR has been catching catching that too. They'll They'll catch DNS sync holding. They'll catch all that kind of stuff. That uh, so that's why endpoint tools are important, and social engineering you've got to watch out for it because you it'll it'll say I'm going to HomeDepot.com for example, but when instead of going to the actual DNS that takes you there, it's actually going to send you to my IP address underneath to my server instead of their server. So. You're not actually where you think you are, and you're sending all this information that you think is safe. Um, so things to always be watch for, watchful for is always be aware of the websites you're visiting. Make sure that they're reputable websites. There's a lot of places that, uh, and a lot of endpoints, they'll tell you that websites at risk. They're not perfect, but they are helpful. Always be aware of any redirects or spelling consistencies. Because these people pay a lot of money to maintain these websites, they're not going to have misspellings on their websites. If you start seeing these misspellings or you get directed to another site, always ask yourself, is this, is this actually what was planned? Another good trick is to use accounts without install privileges. I love my Mac because of this. Uh, it's set where, and Windows has user access accounts. You can turn them all the way down. And what happened is if something tries to change a register setting or it tries to install something on your computer, it's going to prompt you and say, hey, did you do this or do you want to do this? And uh, before it will install it, so you can stop it from installing it right there. Uh, like I said, my, if you, but most people will take those user access controls and turn them all the way up on Windows so they don't have to deal with them. But that's what, that's what Windows had in mind when they put them in. And... Uh, like I said, endpoint tools. Uh, always pay that extra money for the endpoint tools. They will take care. Of, they will take care of you in the future. I wouldn't be remiss if I didn't talk about passwords here a little bit. Uh, it's very important. Number one, it's like the most important thing in the world. Never show your password. It doesn't matter who it is. It's CEO calls, president, school, dean, IT, security. If they call and ask for your password. Don't give it to them. If they should have access to your password, they can reset your account and you can reset your password when you're done. Uh, passwords should always be unique and complex. Uh, and unique is very important. Uh, it, it, even the pattern that you create your passwords. We had this one company that I was the go-to guy. They installed all of our routers and switches. When people didn't remember what the password was, they called me up because I had already figured out the the algorithm they use to hash their passwords, and I can generally get it in the third or fourth try. So I'd say, if you haven't got it in four tries here, call me back and we'll do something else. And they always called me back and said, oh, number one worked, number two worked. So you always want to be careful. That's why dogs' names and things like that get you in trouble because a lot of people use pet names and then they put an at sign for A, an exclamation point for an I, I think a three for an E. So 
People are getting pretty aware of that, and that's the first thing they put in their password list, dictionaries, when they're trying to attack people. So keep that in mind. And a lot of people are opting for passphrases, which is some words you'll remember, but you also got to be careful of that because I can probably hit about four or five passphrases that's going to get me into quite a bit of computers just by guessing because they're common movie quotes or something like that. Um, never leave a copy of your passwords lying around. Uh, I see that a lot. Uh, you can flip over somebody's monitor, or not their monitor, but their keyboard, and there's a password underneath it. I've actually seen monitors with a sticky note that said password. <laughs> so, <laughs> and, and that's kind of the conundrum you get with passwords is, is uh, some people make passwords so secure that they don't remember them. So now they've got to write them down. Well, that's called being over secure because once you write it down, now you've got a piece of paper that's got your password on it. And always change your password regularly because if somebody uh, does attack, if they're sitting there attacking your passwords, if you're resetting it the 30, 60, 90 days that are recommended depending on where you work or where you go to school, they'll, uh, and you follow that, it causes their dictionary attack to basically have to be redone because they might have passed that password. They, so that protects you from people sitting there. In case you don't know, a dictionary attack is just a long list of words that they sit there and run against your username and see if they can get it right. So, um, so sensitive information is an interesting topic. We all we all hear about FERPA. We all, all hear about uh, PCI and all of that. So obviously we know about that, and we know not to share it with unauthorized people. We all, uh, one weakness I do see a lot of people use email to transfer information. I've seen passwords go through email, all kinds of things like that. There's plenty of secure mediums out there that you should use instead. Uh, one thing that a lot of people don't realize is that. Uh, you can actually take a lot of non-sensitive information and put it together and infer sensitive information. Uh, I gave an example in the primer I wrote where somebody gets your name, then they find, there, there, there's plenty of them, but then they find out you work at Georgia Tech, and then they find out you're this, and then they find out where you're from. All right, I'll speed it up. And uh, so you put that together and you'll get a lot of, uh, you can infer and turn that into sensitive information. So at the conclusion, you keep in mind that there is no cookie cutter solution. Uh, you just gotta be aware, uh, think, why, think when you're doing something and keep yourself knowledgeable what's going on. Always be aware that even though you know everything today, threats are evolving and what's safe today may not be safe tomorrow. And use your security team uh, and think of that training as that benefit and get your security team as an additional benefit that you can run questions by. And that's it. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, any, anybody has any questions online, I can monitor and we can relay them. Any questions in the room? Uh, is there any uh, follow-up questions for security management software that you recommend, like big ones of one password, last pass, et cetera, mm -hmm. and then how good or bad are their mechanisms that supposedly automatically change passwords for you? Well, uh, the problem with password management that I heard about it is you take every password that you want, and then you put it in something that's blocked by password. Uh, the best thing to do is anytime you you can engage multi-factor authentication, do that so that uh, you're not just relying on that password. And if I was using a password management tool, I would require multi-factor authentication. Uh, so, and you can use, if you don't wanna keep up with your own passwords and you don't wanna have to remember them, you can find multiple password generators. Just make sure that when you set the status, it matches what the password will allow. And then you can just save that in your password management center that uses that multi-factor. What's the difference between a VPN and a firewall? Okay, so a firewall is a network device that blocks traffic based on ports or any other rules. And most firewalls do what's called NAT IP translation. So basically, you know, 
you, what's your IP address? 192.168.whatever. But that's an inside IP address. It, those aren't used on a public internet. So you have a public internet IP address too, and it will translate and affiliate the communication. So it provides you that kind of protection. A VPN is a sort as a transit mechanism. So a lot of firewalls have it. We have it at Georgia Tech where you actually connect to the Georgia Tech account to a firewall or a VPN concentrator. It's just another tool that says, hey, I'm connecting to the VPN. And it's going to give you uh, encryption algorithms. So now all of your traffic will go through it encrypted and it's got to translate before it can pass. So if you buy the service from uh, one of these VPN services, you actually go to their gateway and then it decrypts it and sends it out. Hmm. So can the password manager also be hacked? Password managers can be hacked, and that's why I worry about them. And I've actually put that in a document. That's why you want to use things like two-factor authentication, because two-factor requires more than a password. And some places use multi-factor, where basically you have to use like your thumbprint, which is biometrics. Uh, you can use your swipe, you can use a card you put in or the tokens where it says, like Duo, Duo is multi-factor. So if you got stuff like that, it makes it a lot more difficult to hack. But everything can be hacked if you have time. But probability is low if you do all of that. I, I thought you were still worried. Probability is low if you do it right. Thank you. No other questions. Thank you, Richard. Yeah, thanks.